Welcome back, everyone, and good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on what time zone you're in. My name is Wei Shui Chu. I'm a professor at Texas A&M University, and I'm a member of the Standing Committee. Um, I am a former physicist, uh, like the distinguished uh, uh, speaker in the, in the previous session, and now in computational toxicology and risk assessment. And I'm very pleased to moderate the session on enhancing the dialogue between environmental health and precision medicine. So the objective of this session is to have a dialogue about what new frameworks, people, approaches are needed to address the opportunities and challenges in precision medicine as it integrates with environmental health and exposure data over the next 10 years. The idea is to both look forward in the next 10 years uh, in which we will have you know, access to all types of new, new types of data and how we best to utilize it and also looking backwards from 10 years from now, how will we get to that point? What science is needed um, to, in order for us to achieve that, uh, that goal? And uh, who needs to be involved? How do we get them involved? As well as discussing policy and ethical uh, considerations in uh, moving towards uh, that integration. We have a distinguished expert panel to discuss this scenario. Uh, each panelist will first give a five minute uh, short introductory talk to provide background on their work and their perspectives. Uh, after, the, after which I will describe a particular scenario as a launching point for discussion. So our first speaker is Julia Brody uh, from the Silent Spring Institute. Dr. Brody. Hello everyone, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I do have a few slides, so give me a moment to get them up. So I'm coming to you from Boston and last week was the 50th anniversary of women being officially allowed to run in the Boston Marathon. Um, and that led me to thinking uh, that it was still another 20 years before Congress directed NIH in 1993 to include women in clinical research. And um, the idea that we need data for women as well as men could be thought of as perhaps a small step towards precision medicine. That same year, 6,000 people gathered in the Government Center Plaza in downtown Boston to call for environmental research into women's health, specifically studies of environmental factors and breast cancer to inform prevention. And Mass Breast Cancer Coalition founded Silent Spring Institute to be a scientific team that would take on this work in partnership with activists, clinicians, and policymakers. I'm the second director. I've been the director for more than 25 years. And that has led me to um, a preoccupation drawing on their vision about precision environmental medicine that focuses on advancing primary prevention, community-engaged partnerships, and equity. Precision medicine has the potential to be a counterforce against each of these goals, so I appreciate the chance to discuss a more positive vision. Um, very much consistent with comments that you heard earlier today, um, to focus on prevention, we need a decision framework that reflects the influences on health of exposures across the life cycle and we, we need to remember that recommendations will rarely come from clinical trials. Observational epidemiology is also quite limited. In 2010, the environmental report of the President's Cancer Panel called for a new environmental health paradigm, a scientific approach that would support action without definitive proof. And Silent Spring Institute proposed a model that focuses first on understanding biological mechanisms that is, what do chemicals do on long pathways to disease? Second, um, when chemicals are identified as potentially harmful, how are people exposed? And when we know those two things, we have a basis to reduce exposures. Translating this model for precision environmental medicine, the first step is to identify chemicals that are important in a particular context. To achieve this, chemicals testing becomes part of precision medicine. The second step is to integrate exposure measurements into routine care across the life cycle. And the third step means using those results for personalized exposure reduction, targeted medical monitoring, and public health surveillance and policy. 
Community partnerships and equity considerations will be vital to set priorities and put results into action. As an example of step one, my colleagues recently used data from an EPA ToxCast assay to publish a list of 300 chemicals that increase production of estrogen or progesterone chemicals that are strongly associated with breast cancer. Um, these chemicals are in common exposure sources, including pesticides, uh, hair colors, and other dyes and products of combustion. Um, to, advance, to advance step two, there's been a great deal of innovation in exposure measurement and communicating those exposure results in a right to know, right to act context is one of the tools for engagement and equity. And that's the focus of my own work. So I'm going to turn to some examples to make it possible to and practical to return results in biomonitoring projects of any size. We developed Derby, the digital exposure report back interface, which uses decision rules to personalize um, results and offer individuals context, contextual information about what's important and what they can do. This um, is this could be integrated into electronic medical records, and it includes tools that could be useful for clinicians to evaluate patterns of exposure. It uses a personalized headlines to highlight key results. It can compare results to national, the National Exposure Report from NHANES or to other benchmarks. The headline um, format is, makes it easy to integrate information across individual measurements. So it can handle mixtures and it can integrate genes and environmental um, genes and environment together. It includes individual and community level um, strategies to reduce exposure. We developed a smartphone prototype to expand access in low income communities where this is the primary access to the internet. This is an example of the data visualization tools that would allow a clinician to look at exposures for a patient across many different chemicals, to think about uh, patterns, mixtures, um, highlight high exposures, um, and think about clues to exposure sources. Um, Reports could also include resources for medical monitoring for exposed patients. This is an example for, uh, developed for communities with PFAS drinking water exposures. So um, consistent with the scenario that we're, we're talking about today, um, I wanted to talk in particular about the green housing study of children with asthma living in public housing. My team has interviewed hundreds of participants in exposure studies and interviewed them after they received their reports. And in this particular study, um, in, in all of these studies, we, we see uh, participants brainstorming about exposure reduction. And in the green housing study, parents, for example, reported actions such as avoiding pesticides, switching from pesticides to sticky traps, and switching to products that were fragrance free. They took their results to clinicians, and some said that they got more attentive medical care for their child who, whose symptoms had perhaps been ignored. In conversations with participants, we, we were able to discern sources of high exposures that hadn't been anticipated, for example, burning incense or cooking with a broken kitchen fan. Again, really personalizing the recommendations for how to reduce exposures for these kids. As an example of how exposure monitoring for precision environmental health can work as a public health surveillance system, in the Northern California Household Exposure Study, we surprisingly discovered high levels of flame retardants in California compared with the US. Um, this was due to a unique state flammability standard. Once these measurements were revealed, the flammability standard was revised to reduce exposures without sacrificing fire safety. So precision medicine um, could contribute to this kind of analysis being widely available and important for public health policies. Um, you can see examples of reports from a variety of different studies on our website. 
Um, and I'm very grateful to my very transdisciplinary team and multi-institutional from Silent Spring Institute, Northeastern, UC Berkeley, um, Harvard, and the studies that have uh, helped us uh, field these uh, results reports and learn how people respond to them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Brody. Uh, our second panelist is uh, Dr. Brendan Pierce. Uh, Dr. Pierce, please go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Brandon Pierce, and I am a, a, a genetic and molecular, or genetic and environmental epidemiologist uh, working at the University of Chicago. And um, a little a bit about me: my, my research is really focused on understanding gene environment relationships uh, that are relevant to cancer. <clears throat> so, so there there's sort of two two aspects of the research. One is studying the inherited genome. Um, so the variation, um, you know, in, in the human genome that we inherit from our parents uh, and how that, you know, modifies our, our susceptibility to the effects of environmental uh, exposures. And the answer, sort of the, the other angle that, that I work on is studying the, the impact of environmental exposures on the human genome, sort of focusing on uh, dynamic features of the genome, not, not the variation that we inherit, uh, from our parents, but um, features like um, you know the uh, the length of our telomeres, uh, features like uh, the epigenome, which which isn't the genome sequence, but uh, features of the genome that affect uh, how the genome is packaged and how how genes are turned on and off, uh, and as well as uh, um, acquired mutations in the genome, like mutations that can contribute to cancer. Um, and so, by studying you know the the interactions or the relationships between genetics and environment. You know, our hope is that, that we can better, you know, understand the, the biology of, of what exposures um, do, you know, under the skin, um, have better understand susceptibility to exposures and, and the mechanisms underlying that susceptibility, um, you know, potentially the ability to identify individuals who are, might be at higher risk uh, for, you know, higher risk for um, exposure effects, toxicity, uh, and, and potentially identify biomarkers of, that reflect uh, the effects um, of exposures on health. And so a, a lot of this type of work we, we have pursued um, in, in Bangladesh in particular, uh, which is a, a unique place um, where there's, there's a unique exposure, um, um, arsenic uh, being sort of naturally occurring in the earth in Bangladesh and a lot of the groundwater there um, being naturally contaminated with arsenic. So, you know, the, the sort of sad story in Bangladesh is over the past, you know, you know, 50 or so years, um, the, the, the motivation to eliminate, um, or to reduce surface water as a drinking source and, and promote the use of um, pathogen-free groundwater has resulted in this fairly widespread exposure to arsenic across, across that country. Um, and, you know, arsenic is a metal, uh, it, is a known, it is a known carcinogen. It has um, effects on, on multiple body systems. It's a multi-system toxicant. Um, and so when this sort of exposure to arsenic was, was discovered in Bangladesh, um, you know, several decades ago, um, you know, studies followed, um, cohort studies, you know, were set up in Bangladesh to, to study these effects. And, you know, the, I think the, the, uh, one of the primary goals of these studies was to, was to first and foremost reduce exposure. Um, but to do that, you need to sort of assess exposure in, in the area. And um, by collecting all this information on exposure levels and health, we're able to set up fairly unique um, cohort studies um, that study that, that are really, um, you know, uh, designed to as assess the effects of arsenic on health. And we've been able to do some, some fairly unique work in those studies, um, in part because they have really high quality exposure data and, and, and genetic data is available on large numbers of people you know, in some of these, these studies in Bangladesh. So we've been able to have a kind of a unique niche in that we've been able to study the genetics, how in the inherited genome influences susceptibility to arsenic. Uh, with a strong focus on understanding how people differ in their ability to metabolize arsenic and eliminate arsenic from their bodies. So we've been able to identify, you know, regions of the genome where the variation you inherit uh, impacts your ability to deal with arsenic that you're exposed to, uh, at least in this study, you know, through drinking water. Um, and so you know, we've also done work in this area to think about, you know, returning those types of results um, to, to research participants. So Similar to, to what Julie was saying in the prior talk about, you know, returning information to 
um, to, to exposed individuals. So, you know, in addition to, you know, informing our research participants about, um, you know, their exposure level, uh, actions they can reduce to reduce their exposure. We also have the, the possibility of returning information on their genetic susceptibility to exposure, you know, if they're interested in that, to potentially further motivate them to, um, to take action to reduce their exposure. Um, you know, on the other side, we've also studied arsenic in relation to the dynamic genome features I mentioned in relation to telomeres and epigenetic and somatic mutations with the hope we can potentially identify, uh, not only identify the health effects, but also maybe biomarkers of, of, of exposure effects, signatures that, you know, someone has been exposed, um, you know, to, to arsenic or, 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 other, or, other, um, or other environmental exposures. Um, and one front where we're sort of pursuing now is trying to extend that work beyond um, blood samples, which is what we typically deal with in epidemiological research and human studies, and try to look at, um, you know, using um, um, data sets of, 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 that contain multiple types of tissues obtained from tissue donors and ask, oh, can we look at um, exposure effects on, you know, lung tissues and, and other tissues that are much harder to get in human studies. So that's sort of a growing area of our work. Um, um, and I'll, I'll stop there. I think I've talked about five minutes, so um, uh, I'll pass it on to the, to the next speaker. Okay, thanks very much. Our next uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Lena Rios from the National Hispanic Medical Association. Please oh, take a let's get closer here. Hi, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I'm Dr. Rios with the National Hispanic Medical Association. Uh, you know, we started in 1994 representing 50,000 licensed Hispanic physicians in the United States, and our mission is to improve the health of Hispanics and other underserved, uh, and we primarily do national conferences. We've developed chapters and in an infrastructure that includes doctors who are very interested in, in educating their communities. They are looked at as leaders from their communities. And uh, we also have developed uh, mentoring programs such as our College Health Scholars Program to reach to the pre-health Hispanic students. Uh, funded by the Office of Minority Health this Program has been around for five years, but we've actually been recruiting since 2005 uh, at our national conference. So with the Office of Minority Health, we started focusing on areas in the country where there are more Hispanic students, namely California and Texas. Um, we also started our own foundation, the National Hispanic Health Foundation. We changed the name from NHMA or medicine because we wanted to focus on providing scholarships to students that were going into or, or into the careers by being medical students, nursing, public health, pharmacy, uh, dental, and physician assistants. We have a corporate advisory board, and we are establishing um, through this last few years, uh, a National Center for Hispanic Health Research. So what I wanted to talk about just briefly, why Hispanic community is so important to this topic and how we can be of service and what we've done with environmental um, activities. So Hispanics are 60 million or 19% of the population are projected to be one out of four Americans you know, in, in, by the year 2035. Um, many live in poverty, a social determinants of health, of course, and a long history of discrimination, unequal treatment, accumulation of social and environmental disadvantages, and high prevalence of health disparities in all uh, clinical diseases and conditions. Uh, but they're also very hardworking, essential workers with large families, close social networks. So a lot of opportunity for educating, you know, young people, and they'll get to everybody in the in the family. Um, but they live in close proximity to carbon plants, truck routes, areas with poor air, water, housing, uh, with high levels of chemicals that are detrimental to them. And from research, we know that the history of living with inequality and discrimination leads to toxic stress and chronic disease prevalence, which is really what has led to health disparities in our country. Uh, and I also think the most important thing that we have uh, to think about is that Many of our communities live in medically underserved areas or health professional shortage areas with less, less access to healthcare uh, and services. And also it's Hispanics remain the group that is the largest group without health insurance. Um, and, and I have to say that without uh, very many Hispanic or people that look like them, talk like them, uh, Hispanic um, health professionals at all levels, uh, just for doctors, we're still only 5% of the total doctors in the country. 
we've been pretty much flatlined since the 1970s. So in, in terms of precision medicine and, and, and environmental health, we've been a partner with the All of Us Research Program at NIH since it started in 2017. And I think what's very important is some of the key findings that started the program was that um, you know, Hispanics make up 16% of the population, but only 1% of clinical trial participants. Same with African Americans, 12% of the population, but only 5% of clinical trial participation. And pretty much all of our research uh, you know, has been based on white Caucasians. And it was very important for the country to, to embark on a precision medicine uh, initiative uh, that, in, that includes environmental health. And for Hispanics especially, uh, there was a major report done by a nat the Natural Resources Defense Council on the Hispanic population, and that they found more than half reside in states with the highest levels of climate change threats, such as air pollution, extreme heat, and flooding. Many Hispanic communities face serious health risks by air pollution, again, uh, but also oil and gas uh, with toxic air emissions, uh, including asthma rates that, that affect asthma rates. Extreme summer heat, especially in outdoor occupations, uh, and then, of course, we know all of our seasonal agricultural workers also are faced with many, many pesticides. Low-income uh, Hispanic communities are more likely to live in areas most vulnerable to impact by climate change and natural disasters. Uh, and, of course, there's a major psychological impact. And then I think there's just a few things that are, people don't think about, but one and a half million Latinos live in unincorporated communities especially uh, the U.S.-Mexico border, where there is a lack of potable water, sewage, treatment co uh, contributes to waterborne diseases. Uh, more than a third of U.S. Latinos live in the Western states, where arsenic, industrial chemicals, and fertilizer residues often contaminate local drinking water. 80% of farm workers in the country are Latino, uh, twice as many Hispanic children as non-Hispanic white children, have led in their blood at levels higher than the action level established by the CDC. And approximately 66% of US Latinos or 26 million people live in areas that do not meet the federal government's air quality standards. So there's a lot to be done uh, in terms of the National Hispanic Medical Association and our work with environmental uh, justice. We've worked with the National uh, Natural Resources Defense Council, EDF, Environmental Justice, Green Latinos, and Climate Action Campaign on several advocacy uh, issues uh, running the gamut. I think advocacy is something that's needed, very much so, and policy impact. We work with the Tri Caucus and the Hispanic and Black and Asian Caucuses, as well as the White House with uh, Gina McCarthy. Uh, and we've also been very much involved in mentoring and getting younger people involved um, uh, through, uh, through all our programs. With, with the All of Us Research Program, we've been able to get to our chapter levels uh, and work with uh, uh, getting more people involved in research. And I'll just make one last comment here about the importance of our National Hispanic Health Foundation developing a National Center for Hispanic Research, where we've had PCORI funding uh, and health services research funding to be able to develop a cadre of research researchers at the senior level, working with the junior level. Uh, and I, we've learned, I think what's most important is that Hispanic are trusted, Hispanic doctors and researchers are trusted by the community and we need to develop more um, uh, policies and support for having younger people in in K through 12, not only understand STEM, math, and science, but understand research and the importance of community-designed research, the PCORI center, you know, centered, uh, patient-centered outcomes research, and clinical research. We're actually working to find clinical investigators that are in the communities, in the clinics, community health centers working with academic faculty, and also private practice doctors, because there's so few uh, Hispanic doctors that have the opportunity to do more research because they're always caught in, in a million committees in the hospitals or in our medical schools, you know, doing uh, minority admissions or interviewing or what have you. 
And uh, we've learned as an organization how important it is to focus on developing that next generation of uh, through our pipeline efforts, our mentoring and our leadership development programs. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, our next speaker has, hasn't joined yet, um, Dr. Kyla Sherman Wilkins. So we'll move on to our final panelist, uh, Dr. Alicia Tso from Color Health. Thank you. Thank you. And um, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this panel today. I'm very excited to um, be uh, speaking with all of you. Um, so my name is Alicia Joe. I am the Chief Science Officer for Color Health. Um, my background is that I'm a molecular biologist by training and a cancer researcher. Um, very similar to Brandon, uh, I work on the clinical genetics side of the world, thinking about how your genes uh, hold information that might affect um, what types of traits you might uh, exhibit later on in your life. Um, I'm going to give a quick introduction to myself as well as Color so that folks have a an understanding about that. And please let me know if you can't see my slides, otherwise it will just go ahead and charge forward. So um, Color has uh, been working uh, for the last seven years on really being able to do scale decentralized healthcare delivery. Um, we started out in the field of clinical genetics, really thinking about um, access to uh, gene testing like the RCA1 and 2 sequencing that could be very useful and um, predicting a woman's chance of having breast or ovarian cancer in her lifetime. And actually in the last uh, two and a half years have actually um, spent a lot of our time responding to the COVID pandemic um, by delivering more than 75% uh, of the COVID testing here in the San Francisco Bay area. Recording stopped. Have been- Recording uh, in progress have been doing the uh, scaled vaccine delivery for the state of California as well as uh, multiple other um, states. Um, we have worked with large research programs, and actually, as Elena mentioned, we are part of the All of Us Research Program as well, which I'll go over very briefly as well. But really, the way we think about it is our goal is to bring scaled infrastructure for healthcare program delivery. So thinking about what are the interventions and the care that you want to bring to a community, and how can we make sure that you get equitable access to those interventions across the full population. Um, we started in the world of clinical genetics, and really the way we've thought about it is to always do a patient-centered way of delivering clinical genetics results. So we think about how we can make sure that the patient is a piece and a part and a partner in the delivery of their results. So there is a patient-facing interface for the results delivery. On the back end, we do have our own uh, CAP-CLIA lab for next-generation sequencing. Samples are collected by either saliva or, uh, or blood, and the nice thing about saliva is that it does allow us to have this shift to home modality, meaning that you don't necessarily need to be in a clinical setting in order to provide your biospecimen, but rather you could provide a saliva sample from your own home. That's actually changed a lot of the way that we are able to um, extend access to genetic testing. This is a uh, room temperature stable biospecimen that can be mailed through the standard USPS mail and um, has been one of the ways in which we've been able to reach a lot of the individuals who uh, traditionally don't have access to clinical genetics. Those samples are then sequenced here um, at our uh, San Francisco-based uh, lab, and then we're able to do the interpretation of those results and return those results back to the patient and their provider through a web-based interface. And then, importantly, figuring out how to integrate that data into the care delivery system such that that data is actually used longitudinally by the provider uh, and the care team to actually uh, improve and hopefully change uh, the, the, the care for that patient. Underlying uh, the work that we do is really this ability to have all these different pieces of the infrastructure, as I mentioned. So we think about all the way from recruitment all the way through to the return of um, genetic results. We're thinking about having a patient-centered view on that. So of course, there's the ability to collect biospecimen in the first place, as I mentioned, using saliva or blood collection, and the generation of that data is important. But it's also important to understand the participant's point of view, making sure that they have the ability to consent into the return of results that they would like to get, that they have a view into where their sample is at any given time. And then when their results are ready, that there is a patient-supported workflow in which they can get their results back. 
So as part of that, um, we also have uh, started offering, or uh, since the beginning have offered uh, genetic counseling as part of our workflow. I think when it comes to the return of these types of results, which are relatively new still for patients and providers, it's important to have the right specialists to help support that return of results. And so genetic counseling is a huge component of the return of these results. And actually, as I talk a little bit more about the All of Us Research Program, I can talk about the way um, in that program, we've thought about genetic counseling as well. So one of the things that I do want to emphasize here is that I think we are shifting into a different framework and mindset when it comes to the use of genetics for precision medicine. Um, I think we started in a world where we very much thought of it as phenotype first, phenotype being the observable characteristics of an individual. And we thought about identifying individuals who had rare phenotypes, who had um, abnormal phenotypes, and then having them be uh, undergo genetic sequencing to try to identify the cause of that uh, rare or abnormal phenotype. And in doing so, we're searching for that molecular diagnosis. This has been really useful and helpful for the identification of rare diseases and certainly has been very instrumental for diagnosing many of these uh, genetic linked uh, high penetrance diseases um, that we know about today. But I think where we are now is that we are moving into this genotype first world, where now that um, getting whole genome sequencing done, getting genetic testing done is becoming much more accessible and affordable. It does mean that you're going to have many more folks who are getting their genome sequence first, getting their genetic testing done first. These individuals don't necessarily have any rare or abnormal phenotypes, but now we have all of this rich genetic data that now we can use to try to predict how that genetics might impact their eventual phenotype and then hopefully use that data to improve health outcomes. Now, of course, what's really important in this then is to understand the, that as, as well as having genotypes and genetics being influencing your eventual uh, phenotype, the environmental factors are going to be quite important here as well. And as Brandon spoke to earlier, these things will interact with each other. And so understanding what's in your genetics, but also understanding what your environmental exposures are, are ultimately going to be the combination of these two things that help us to determine what types of health outcomes you might, uh, you might uh, have. So um, this is the type of genetics today that we, we typically are able to return. There's a set of actionable monogenic findings. These are relatively rare in the population, but an example of this is um, if you have a uh, pathogenic variant in the BRCA1 gene, um, this causes a greatly increased chance for uh, hereditary breast cancer and ovarian cancer. Very famously, Angelina Jolie has a mutation in this gene, which has resulted in her, in her taking action early to prevent breast and ovarian cancer for herself. There's pharmacogenetics, which is the way that our body interacts with and metabolizes drugs. Um, this can be quite important for environmental factors as well, um, and understanding how your body reacts to different uh, external compounds can be very important. And um, to Elena's point, a lot of this uh, information has mostly been collected in um, uh, European and Caucasian individuals, and being able to understand a better diversity of these individuals is going to be important for us to be able to integrate this, this kind of data into care. And then there is now the uh, recent um, use of polygenic risk scores. And this is really thinking about all of the risks that you harbor across your entire genome. There's not a specific one mutation that's causing risk for disease. But if you sum up all of the genetic factors across your whole genome, everybody is on a different spectrum of risk. And this is where environmental factors can play a huge role in changing your outcome eventually. Um, and the last thing I do want to touch on is the All of Us Research Program, to, in, in which we are the genetic counseling resource. Our job here is to help return the genetic results back to all the participants in this study. Elena already mentioned this, but the All of Us Research Program is uh, this landmark study that's being con conducted by the NIH. The goal is to recruit 1 million participants across the United States over the course of 10 years. And, and specifically to recruit these individuals from populations that are underrepresented in biomedical research. And um, what that means is that the goal of the study is to achieve a recruitment goal of at least 70% of its participants to be um, individuals who are traditionally underrepresented in biomedical research. That's not just um, on ancestry or race, but it's actually also age diversity, it's uh, gender diversity, it's also rural versus urban diversity, socioeconomic status diversity. And I think ultimately it is 
these types of resources are going to help us understand and get the right data to really understand how we integrate environmental factors with genetic factors to predict uh, this new era of precision medicine. Great, thank you very much. We'll now go on to our discussion, and I want to sort of paint the scenario picture that um, is sort of the main topic uh, or launching point for this uh, for this panel discussion. So the scenario is a patient from a community visits a primary care physician and complains of difficulty breathing, occasional rashes, constant headaches. Her family has a history of cancer. Another close relative was recently diagnosed with cardiovascular dementia, and grandchildren living nearby uh, suffer from asthma. Um, uh, and was uh, recently re diagnosed with a learning disability. Uh, the patient wants to know if all of these are connected and if the environment could play a role. And we're thinking, you know, 10 years from now where physicians may have access to not just the genomic data that we were just talking about, but also environmental exposure data um, uh, that, that Julia was talking about and lifestyle and behavioral factors as well that um, a number of you have touched on. Uh, so how, how would we actually utilize this, uh, all this data to try to um, provide some actionable information uh, for, the, for this patient. I want to start. Well, I'll just start with uh, an understanding that a doctor has to be able to communicate with their patient, and have a, uh, an understanding of where the patient lives and, and uh, the social determinants of health, especially uh, and also the environmental factors. Um, uh, I think that that's very important. And I think the, uh, the family and patient history uh, that can be expanded with genetic testing, and I'm sure the, the experts here can talk more about specifics, but I just think that the me precision medicine tools of the future are going to have to be able to correlate the um, exposure times and the uh, you know, they have an understanding of, of where uh, the, uh, the grandchildren, the family, where they live, where they've grown up, where they spend their time, uh, the work history, especially the occupations. Um, and and where, is the, where is the community in terms of, uh, uh, I'll, I'll say a climate frontline community uh, or first line or essential communities that, um, uh, that we would look at um, in terms of you know, our environmental uh, grading, if you will. Um, so I'll just start there. Okay. Uh, I'll jump in since sure. the green housing study uh, conducted by CDC and HUD focused exactly on asthma and um, the role of uh, various environmental exposures in asthma. And uh, so I think you, you could start there um, with talking about pesticide use, with thinking about air pollutants from both indoor and out, outside the home. Some of these could be readily assessed with uh, questions asked to the parents. And, um, but 10 years from now, um, there also are, there's also been just a proliferation of new exposure measurement devices so that you could send home a passive air sampler or ask a child to wear a wristband for a week and you could get a much clearer picture of what might be the exposure sources that are relevant to asthma and think about um, fragrances and consumer product chemicals that maybe haven't been on doctors' minds as much, although I think asthma doctors are pretty, pretty up on fragrance as a potential trigger. And, and then thinking about the question of whether those other diseases are linked um, raises for me the, the issue that we need to share the information that we know and also um, let people know what we don't know. And so I, in this particular scenario, there's not enough information to may, maybe make connections, but in the case of actual patient care, you might know more about those other cases and whether they seem likely to be linked, for example, by high air pollution, which could cause uh, mm -hmm. other kinds of outcomes. But you could also be, it's also important to be 
transparent, that we don't make one-to-one -one connections between an exposure and a particular disease, and that we, we don't necessarily know. We might have lots of evidence that these things can cause an illness, but, but the, the correspondence isn't one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one of the things that um, when I think about 10 years from now, what we hope to have, I think a huge component of this is the ability to have collected that data in some way that informs this clinical decision. And I think, Julia, you made a really great point, which is that hopefully in 10 years from now, there is going to be empirical data that can be collected from devices that can be integrated into that care. But also there should hopefully also be standard surveys and questionnaires that all clinicians use and can be coded for us to be able to understand what are the environmental exposures that this family, these individuals are facing. Um, I think this is actually really interesting because early on in sort of the introduction of genetics into, um, into care, we, we faced the same issue where a lot of the care was being done um, in a very specialized way. And then you would have all of these sort of unstructured uh, clinician notes that were maybe in the medical record, but probably weren't. And instead you really just had this sort of one clinician who really understood this case and understood the molecular diagnosis of this case case, um, in order for us to have really scaled to, and we're still struggling to, uh, to really bring precision medicine with genetics to large populations, it, at the end it has to be that that data is integrated into the EHR in some way that every clinician can view. And then also there's a shared understanding from the expert standpoint in terms of what are the factors that are going to influence this kind of a disease. Um, and so I hope about 10 years from now that there is regular uh, sort of normalized collection of that data, both from the survey side as well as from the uh, device side, but then also some way for all of that data to go into a shared public com common uh, database for mm -hmm. clinicians and researchers to be able to derive insights together off that data. Because I think ultimately without that, it will be very hard to get out of the, the, the world in which you're doing sort of this bespoke one-to-one -one diagnosis. Yeah, so Alicia, I wanted to, um probe on a couple of things from your presentation. One was the genetic counseling. Are we going to need essentially environmental and gene environment, social determinant counseling yeah. services as part of the healthcare delivery, precision medicine, environmental health nexus? Um, so maybe start, start with that. Is, that. is that a model that can be scaled to this level of complexity? I mean, this is a really great question. I think one of the things that we are trying to do in the in the clinical genetics space is actually to teach more primary care physicians how to counsel, especially some of these more common genetic areas. Um, I think that at the end of the day, genetic counseling is going to be quite useful, especially when you're talking about counseling whole family uh, and talking about individual specific case. But for common genetic disorders, when I say common, they're still relatively rare in the population, probably one to two percent of the population. But hopefully, a primary care physician should understand the implications of a BRCA1 mutation and be able to counsel you on that. Um, in terms of that sort of scale delivery, uh, especially as you think about integration of environmental factors, I actually think this is an area I'm sure Brandon has a lot of experience in having done this in Bangladesh, so I'd love to hear what his point of view is. You're on the spot. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I guess, you know, the my mind was on sort of the, the first question of, um, you know, does the, the, the primary care physician have the, the basic knowledge base, um, you know, to be able to connect these dots, right? Does, does, does the physician um, have, you know, you know, complete knowledge of the, um, the, the environmental exposures locally, that wherever this is, patient is from, the, the key environmental exposures that are of concern, and can the physician, um, you know, ha have an, does they have the knowledge base to link those exposures um, to the symptoms that are being reported, right? Or if it's very common exposures with symptoms, everybody, you know, maybe it's, it's straightforward, um, <clears throat> but they're, you know, you know, Obviously, that there's government agencies that do monitoring of water and air, you know, EPA, USGA, you know, to, to build that knowledge base of what exposures are are um, are a particular concern where. But you know, some of those might not be on everybody's radar, um, which actually brings to mind this 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 new this app this sort of phone app that's been developed um, by uh, um, you know colleagues of mine in Chicago as, as a part of an environmental health center here 
we have people developing an app that can be used by people in the community to report, you know, environmental concerns that they have and, and put them on a map, right? Because some of these may be sort of, you know, micro exposures, right? That are, they're not a huge people, a number of people are exposed to. So I, I guess that, you know, first understand the local exposures. And then, um, you know, I, I like, you know, all of your ideas about how to, how to gather in additional information on that, whether it's gathering, you know, it's gathering data on air samples at home or, or, or through wristbands or mm -hmm. through, you know, collection of participants, uh, you know, uh, or collection of patients' blood and urine samples you know, that can be used to directly measure, measure the exposure. Um, so I guess, you know, to start with, we need, um, you know, the, the physician to have, to have the right knowledge base to be able to connect all these dots. Um, and, um, so that was the first thought I had. So uh, Alicia, I'm re returning, returning to, to what you asked me. Could you, could you sort of restate that? Um, um, yeah, I, I, I am, I think at the end of the day, it is, you do have to figure out how to integrate all of those data into, um, into care. And I, and I feel like this is probably an area, um, where we could use specialists, but the scalable solution is going to be to use primary care physicians. And do we do we believe that primary care physicians will have that ability, or or is there going to be the need for like a specialized task for a specialized uh, profession uh, for for the return of these types of results? Before I get to Julia, uh, Elena, I think this reminds me of some of what you were saying about how a lot of the doctors in these communities are already overburdened. Um, because they're they're medically underserved, and um, the the need to you know put put another layer of of sort of um, continuing education, or in terms of really, or maybe that you know ten years is too short to really build capacity for the next generation. But well, you know, longer term. Well, I mean, and maybe you want to comment on that. Yeah, let me comment on. I, I, so I'm a general internist by training, uh, and uh, actually went to public health school before medical school to learn about small area analysis and um, planning mm -hmm. communities. And honestly, I think that now we know uh, with genetic uh, counseling and also with uh, social determinants of health, these concepts that are much broader than just looking at a disease that primary care doctors do need to understand the broader context of medicine and, and the inclusion of public health uh, with medicine. Uh, especially having gone through this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and, and I do think that the future primary care physician is the still the gatekeeper, if you will, you know, to refer to consultation for, for special, um, you know, whether it's pulmonologist for the asthmatic, mm -hmm. the asthmatic or, or what have you. Uh, when I said the, the extra burden is because there's so few Hispanic right. doctors for Hispanic patients that we also need to understand the importance of training those doctors and providers who work in a predominantly Hispanic community, how to better interact with the Hispanic population. And that's the concept of cultural competence and the class standards. Um, so I think that that's part of this scenario is that there has to be an understanding that we're never gonna have enough Hispanic doctors for the Hispanic population or the black doctors for the black population. But in, in, in our National Health Service Corp model, I think just needs to be, has to, has to have more of a career focus instead of just a revolving door where doctors go to work in a clinic to, to get their loans repaid for three years and then leave. There needs to be a new, a, a new association of, of how uh, the doctors that take care of a community need to really understand that community, to understand the, how to educate the community to change their behaviors uh, uh, and adapt to the behaviors of, of the climate change and, and to better, um, you know, to better take advantage of the opportunities of new technology. And, and I also think it's going to, there's going to be a huge push for artificial intelligence within the, within these communities that have not had that data before to be able to understand how to use data in, in our communities of color and disparities communities to, to, to make changes. Julia? Well, I want I wanted to add about this problem that while I love the vision of the gene environment counselor sometime in the future, um, one of the goals of, of Derby is to automate the knowledge base. So it, it has a content library that physicians as well as patients can use 
so that when you get a result, it's in the context of what's known about health health effects and it's linked to information about exposure reduction so that an individual doctor doesn't have to know all the things that we, we really can't realistically expect them to know about environmental exposures. And instead they have this library that's that's linked to the to the measurements so that they're they have uh, the content library is being being served to them in relationship to the particular result that they're dealing with. And yeah, that kind of segues into one of the Q and A questions. That um, you know, what research on communication of science and social science is necessary for advancing the translation of this sort of technical knowledge that we hope will be will be gaining? Um, is there any additional sort of science that needs that's needed to make this information sort of applicable to the physicians and decision makers? And and you know, what what are some some potential ways uh, uh, to accomplish that? Yeah, I think that there, this, um, at the end of the day, I think we have to really think about the researchers and their role in um, sort of bringing this future um, uh, to fruition. And I think that the researchers need to work together as a community and start to understand how to um, sort of, what, are the, what is the nomenclature for the environmental exposures that they all agree on so that physicians can, can use the same words? And this is actually something that in the genetics community that we had to figure out as well, because if the researchers can't agree about what it's called and, and how, much, how much of it, uh, how much exposure results in what kind of disease risk, if the researchers can't agree about those things, then it becomes very hard then for the physician to deliver that information to a patient. Um, especially what you don't want to happen is for a patient to go to two different physicians or two different specialists and get very different uh, information or different recommendations, or even be told completely opposite things about whether that environmental exposure actually um, has contributed to their disease risk or not. Um, and so I think part of that is it, it is on the research community to start to understand what is the shared um, nomenclature and the shared uh, sort of classification of risk that um, that that we want to use. How do we um, then educate the clinical community about using using that that framework and then um, thinking about then what are the how to educate and work with the patient community to make sure that the words that we're using are actually understandable to them. And I think that's something that in the genetics community that we we kind of are learning how to do now. For example, in the genetics community, we often say you have a positive result if you have a, a disease-causing variant in your genome. And the word positive, of course, has these connotations of something good has happened in, in normal speak. Um, and we've, we've learned that telling somebody that they have a positive result in this way can actually um, not be that useful. And for the All of Us Research Program, we actually did a bunch of comprehension testing and realized that we can't even use that word when we, when we return that, um, that result. And instead, we need to immediately address Address that there is something significant for their health that was found in that report. So I do think there's a lot of this sort of communication um, that has to, uh, communication uh, sort of iterations on nomenclature and verbiage that has to be done. I think first, I think the researchers and the clinicians need to agree about what they want, uh, what is the framework in which they want to uh, classify these exposure risks. Yeah, and I do think there should be, you know, continuing medical education again, that, that brings this uh, into fruition for the future learning. And I think there should be more learning communities, like you said, and, and honestly, there's so much that policy can do uh, with the um, Medicaid population, for example, the Medicaid waivers that states have, states that have large rural populations could, could do more for rural health education uh, with the environment about heat and, and pesticides, et cetera or the, uh, you know, the water, communities on the water. Uh, there's just all kinds of things I think that pol the policy could do when you think about uh, reimbursement to states for education. It's not just about diabetes or, or heart disease, chronic diseases, but actually looking at environmental impacts um, and adding that to the, uh, you know, to, to the uh, I guess, to the, to the learning community at large. So I guess one of the other questions which is of great interest to the sponsors is what what type of research is needed to, you know, in terms of funding or, you know, you know, what type of grants or what subject areas need to be addressed 
um, you know, in order to, to sort of actualize this type of, of vision? Are there, are there specific areas that are currently under, under resourced that need to be emphasized more? Um, are there things that, you know, just people haven't really thought of or, or things that are more multidisciplinary that, that are in the current environment difficult to, uh, you know, difficult to get funding for? You know, what are some particular suggestions for, for how do we move, move in this direction? Well, I'll just say I think multidisciplinary, especially you know, it was brought up about women's health, for example, and I know uh, women's health in the environment is very important, but also the uh, when you talk about, uh, and I'll just go back to the Hispanic health or if you want to call it health disparities work, Office of Minority Health and at HHS, uh, working with all of the different agencies that, that have, uh, uh, you know, EPA, for example, and agencies that have more direct impact with policies that can change, uh, where they can show direct impact of health and how they need to change policies uh, in the environment. Uh, you know, with auto emissions, that's the Department of Transportation. So there's definitely a need for a, a more, um, a broader, uh, you know, collaborative effort for policies. And I also think, and I'll just put that plug in again, that I think there needs to be a, a real focus on the next generation of researchers. Um, and, and having uh, uh, students learn about the importance of these types of careers, not just think about climate change as something, you know, uh, what a fad to get involved with because other young people are involved, but that there really is an impact that's needed from a research perspective. And, and public health research, or if you want to call it, you know, whatever you want to call it, the, it there's so much importance uh, uh, related to public health. I would like to reiterate from my earlier remarks that we need to know a lot more about what chemicals do biologically yeah. uh, and what, what do mixtures do when you we're not exposed to one chemical at a time. What, what does the combination of exposures do? What are the early effect markers that we can use to say that um, short of full-flown disease, which is not a preventive approach to to health. So um, I think we still have a really big knowledge gap in understanding what the effects of chemicals are in the body. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think in, in addition, the other thing that we um, have to really start to understand is the acknowledgement that these environmental factors play a role in our health. And I think Elena and Julie, you mentioned that. Um, and the original question about what kind of funding needs to be put in place, I do think um, probably breaking it down by disease area um, can be helpful, especially the areas where we know environmental factors have a huge impact today. Um, pulmonology is an area where I think we've, we've already talked about and in the case study was uh, was the example as well. You know, are there, are there already areas in which there's clear environmental impact on disease risks that we can use as the first case to show why um, taking into account environmental factors is going to be very important. I think the other thing that Elena has said a couple of times, I think is very important and is and people are beginning to understand is social determinants of health. Um, but I think also with social determinants of health, um, I feel like we're using a very sort of um, crude measure for that right now, where we're thinking about sort of zip code level data or thinking about uh, social economic status as a, as a proxy to things that are in social determinants of health. I do think ultimately we really need to think about what it means you know, access to a safe home environment, this food security, um, you know, being able to uh, access care when you need it, those are all things that are tied under social determinants of health. And so I do think that having more research in that area, being able to break down all of those um, subcategories and understanding mm -hmm. what that actually means um, is going to be very important for us to sort of realize this vision that's 10 years from now. And, and the other thing is really the communications needed by the messengers that you know that that are trusted by the community to change the community's behavior, uh, you know, um, I, I mean, I grew up in the '50s and '60s when people in Los Angeles. I grew up in Los Angeles. Everybody had an incinerator in their backyard and burned their own trash. I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> now, now California is going into composting, and everybody's going to have to learn how to compost. And it's going to be against the law in California not to comp compost your own trap, your own food waste. So we have to think in terms of policies that can help with 
changing behavior and not being afraid of taking tests, not being not being afraid of the government and and uh, trusting. Uh, and, and that's one of the best things about all of us. The All of Us Research Program has allowed everybody that lives here, whether you're a citizen or not, to become a participant in the program. I did get something to add. Yeah, I can. Uh, I'd like to follow up on uh, Julia mentioned about um, you know understanding understanding exposures, their biology, their effects, what is going on. And since this session is sort of focused on um, you know future thinking, what what sort of technology we will have access to, I think we should at least mention you know uh, at least sort of exposomic technologies, right? That can take a, a biospecimen and, and do some sort of you know global or quasi global measurement, right, of, of exposure content in that sample. And I realize, and I don't really work in that area <clears throat> with those, those types of mass spec technologies. Um, um, and I know it's still a very a rapidly developing area where there's a lot of work to be done. I think, I think Bob Wright is on this call. You may talk, you may have a session on this later, right? Um, but it's an area that I'm excited about. I mean, in part because there's, you know, um, probably interesting genetic studies we could do to understand differences amongst people, um, you know, in terms of their um, profiles of, you know, various metabolites for exposures measured globally. Um, and if we apply these technologies, you know, if, they, if the technology is developed to the point where we can, you know, feasibly apply them in large studies, like all of us, um, you know, is that is, is sort of a big data approach, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a good way to learn about exposure effects. Um, I you think it remains, uh, I mean, I'm hopeful it can be, but I guess it remains to be seen. And in this clinical setting, like could a technology like that be helpful for understanding, um, um, you know, the environmental exposure concerns that this, that this patient is having, you know, um, you know, you know, could we get to the point where we could have, you know, um, somewhat automated ways of, of analyzing that data to pull up, you know, a, a list of exposures of potential concern that might potentially be, you know, useful to that patient. So yeah. I'm going to press on this a little bit because I feel like, I mean, the way currently we're, do, we're doing this is, is analogous to the model genetic diseases, right? We're doing one chemical at a time and it's actually even worse for just the monogenetic than just that because chemical exposures have different levels. Whereas a, the modern genetic disease is just more of an on-off kind of thing. And then on the, uh, you know, Alicia, you showed that for pharmacogenomics, we have 14 genes, but how long have we, we've been working on that? We only have 14, right? Uh, in which there's an interaction with drugs that, and one of the other questions that maybe if there's time to get to was about whether those 14 genes also might be relevant for environmental chemical uh, ADME, right? Um, but like we're, uh, like it seems like there's a there's a long way to go perhaps to get from you know the monochemical ex exposure relationships to the polychemical and then polychemical plus social determinants and and and, and genetics together like how how are we going to try to pave a path there um, that won't take a hundred years I guess yeah I think. Um... I think one thing that we certainly have now that we didn't have uh, before is that we've learned a lot about how to handle and derive insights from large amounts of data. I think that's a huge amount of improvement in that field that has um, that has been seen over the last 10, 20 years. Um, the ability to analyze large amounts of data, multiple sources of data, and being able to actually derive insights about causation, correlation from that data, um, we've greatly improved all of those methodologies in the past uh, 15 years or so. Um, I do think that uh, for that reason, I actually do feel like it, this is a um, a surmountable problem um, if we can have uh, a way to store that data, collect that data, and have that data across a diverse and large set of, um, of individuals. Um, I think that's one of the things about um, when you're trying to do this sort of, uh, you know, all of these inputs, um, having all of these uh, risk factors for a disease, at the end of the day, the only way that you can really derive good and solid insights from that is to start from a place where everybody has the same input data, right? So I do think being able to invest now in the data infrastructure for how are we going to store this? Make sure it's not just, you know, um, notes in the in the EMR that are completely 
unorganized and unstructured, but actually have structured ways to be storing that data and to and to get the buy-in from the community that everybody's going to use this um, this database is going to be really important. Um, and and I think yeah, the the point about pharmacogenetics is interesting, right? The pharmacogenetics and actually genomics in general. What we've learned is there are you know all of these genes across the human genome, but at the end of the day, we actually only understand really a handful of them in terms of how they really, really interact with um, your disease phenotypes. Um, I do think that we are moving to a place now where we are able to consider polygenic um, considerations for disease, and that's actually a huge step forward for the genetics community. Uh, it is going to be another large step forward for us to be able to integrate um, environmental uh, signals as well, um, but it all comes down to you got to start with collecting that data across a large population in a structured way so that we can start to really derive the correct uh, insights from that. I think the other thing is key to all of this is going to be risk, the risk involved and risk management, but also looking at um, what communities or what environmental exposures have the highest risk. Um, you know, like the, I'll just say the Flint, Michigan case, the water quality, I mean, it's horrible, but how, I mean, I'm sure that it's everywhere, uh, but we have to look for it and and uh, and, uh, and have a way of for policy and funding to go to those highest risk uh, to take care of those, you know, to cut the to kind of nip it in the bud, if you will. Even though these environmental exposures have been there forever, but as we find uh, ways to handle and treat, that we uh, do take care of it. We don't just let it, you know, get worse. Um, and I, I could see that with, with policies. So th there's another question from the Q&A about uh, following up on the big data. It, what, what kind of investments in you know, data science, maybe research needs to be made in order to, to sort of um, you know, prepare us for that, uh, for that future uh, on, the, on the data infrastructure and, you know, data, and big uh, data analytics methods and, and things? Are, are there particular areas that you see as as uh, as there being a need? Oh, absolutely. I think data science mm -hmm. is going to play a huge role in all of this. And I think mm -hmm. that all of the sort of improved technology, improved techniques that we have for data science, you know, from machine learning to just being able to make a linear regression model for multiple, uh, you know, multifactorial sort of uh, inputs for disease risk, I think is going to be important. Uh, underlying that, though, is the data infrastructure. And that's that's actually costly, mm -hmm. right? Hosting all of this data and putting it all in a single place for folks to access it and analyze it. Um, I think one of the things that uh, oftentimes is underestimated is the cost of simply maintaining all of that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is in all of us research program, there's a specific award that was given just for the data center, right? Just for the data center is going to host all this data and make it available for researchers to use. And so when I think about sort of the funding that could help in this area or, or areas in which, uh, you know, um, the NIH or, or, or other federal agencies could have an impact, you know, being making available this common data base and, and the underlying data infrastructure to support that could be a huge investment that could be very, very important for the ability to really derive um, strong insights from this. And then definitely training our data scientists of the future mm -hmm. to understand that they have to have this multidisciplinary approach, that they need to understand the biology, but they also need to understand the statistics and being able to bring that together is going to be incredibly important. Yeah, on the on the training, I was wondering whether you know training grants might be a method to, as opposed to just you know R one or you know research individual research grants or training grants might have more flexibility uh, in terms of you know promoting that kind of multidisciplinary uh, uh, you know training essentially. Um, and I, I don't know whether you all have any any thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I think one thing with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we realized that NIH could become a little bit more focused on collaboration outside of the re individual researchers and looking at coalition building. Um, uh, let's say for the future, the coalition should include the data users and, and, the, and the, you know, having the data uh, infrastructure con con connected to each uh, let's say grant around certain like asthma or certain uh, diseases and uh, just like it, and it could be connected to the all of us, but I think that, but I think that the um, importance of having researchers 
connected to the communities that they do the research in with some type of collaborative effort with, uh, mm -hmm. say, if it's an agricultural area that the U.S. Department of Agriculture get involved, not just the EPA, and that there, there be more um, cross-cutting policies. We, in our HHS, we called it, uh, when I, I was at HHS before, uh, health and all policies. And in this case, it's environment and all policies and environment and genetics, I think. Um, uh there's a lot to be done. As an example of that multidisciplinary training, I, I happened to co-lead mm -hmm. with Phil Brown, a T32 training program that trains environmental health scientists in social science and vice versa, the attention being to facilitate community-based research by cross-training across these fields. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we run a program for CDC actually uh, on having leadership development of, of physicians involved in public health because, you know, even just public health and medicine are never connected. So yeah. there has to be more training, um, cross training. I, I do feel like that um, these days trainees need to be armed with just basic knowledge of how to handle mm -hmm. um, large data science problems, mm -hmm. then really that means that, you know, instead of, you know, you need to take your molecular biology and your cell biology and your human physiology, but then you also need to take your, you know, statistics course, you have to understand your basic, uh, you know, maybe even understanding how to handle sort of that bioinformatics side of things that the data that flows through the pipe, how do you, how do you use it, um, I think is going to be really important. And I do think uh, these days, a lot of training programs are including uh, data science and, uh, and uh, machine learning and computational biology as parts of the of the um, curriculum, but I think it has to become sort of required curriculum rather than optional. Um, and I feel like that will help a lot in terms of arming the future generation with the right um, tools to actually handle some of these problems. Yes, I want to sort of close with discussion of, you know, sort of privacy, ethic, ethical, equity, access to data kind of um, issues and how, you know, how you see those playing out in, you know, the kind of genomic plus exposomic plus social determinants plus, you know, all these, um, all these things together, like how, uh, what are some of the barriers and challenges in, in terms of the, you know, ethics, equity and privacy security space? I can just say one of the biggest <clears throat> barriers is the our own biases, uh, and especially those who do not come from a certain community and go there to do research and may look down on the community or you know have microaggressions or or some other discrimination. And I think that's the worst thing that could happen. Uh, I think people need to be trained before they go into a community they're not from, uh, and and to understand the importance of of, of those ethical considerations. Yeah, I think the other piece of that is just to make sure that there is unbiased collection of that data across the board. I think um, mm -hmm. to Julia's point, to, to the extent that we can use empirical measurements using devices to measure, you know, air quality and particulates, et cetera, you know, having those devices actually be uh, available and that data available across um, all of the geographies is important and not have them be super concentrated in more affluent areas or more in large metropolitan areas and then all of a sudden we have this huge gap in data from more of our rural communities that 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 kind of it, that kind of unconscious uh, bias is the reason why we currently have a lot of gaps in our data today and so making sure that we are able to collect that data equitably across all of our communities is going to be important uh, and then also just understanding that yeah to Elena's point that the researchers don't go in and just say we're here to answer a research question and in doing so might actually um sort of uh, harm the relationship with the community uh, between the clinicians and the community um you know you have to work together on that and make sure that the, that, the, that the participants feel like they have a part in that research rather than feeling like they are being studied um, by a researcher i think those are those are really important in terms of getting towards several people mentioned that a normalized data collection and the data infrastructure i mean even the the you know building that infrastructure it mm -hmm. seems like it it has the potential to be biased from the start just by how what's it what is included in it how it's coded you know uh, what it what's missing and so it, does that mean we kind of need to do a lot of this kind of community-based 
work before we decide on what the ultimate you know norm uh, you know normalized data collection tool or or data infrastructure are mm -hmm. yeah i think the community based research is most important here and i i do think that um, our research enterprise has really been focused on the academic uh, researchers inside an, you know, a, a bubble, if you will, uh, of the academic uh, health center. And I think we need to, again, COVID-19 showed us the importance of doing research with community uh, input and uh, having more um, community at, at all levels, at the design phase, the, the, the implementation phase, uh, you know, the questionnaire phase, et cetera. Um, to, to lessen that as much as possible, to lessen the bias. Julia and Brandon, do you have any final thoughts before we, we close? I mean, I echo those comments on community-based research that, um, you know, we should really ideally be speaking with the community, um, you know, first to see what their interests are and their, um, you know, what they would like to see in terms of research and environmental problems addressed in their community and let that guide setting research agendas. Julia, last word. Related to your question about privacy, I think we haven't yet grappled with the potential um, privacy risks associated with environmental data, and that is going to be important to community trust and to using the data for good and not stigmatization. And uh, genetics is ahead of us in that regard, and we have some catching up to do. All right. Thanks, everyone. I thought it was a, a great, robust discussion of the intersection of precision medicine, environmental health. And uh, thank you all for your participation. And uh, now I'll turn it over to back to Kristen. Hi, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for this really, um, really wonderful discussion and thinking about the ideas of where we need to move forward, both the science, the funding, and, and sort of a dealing with the ethical issues. We will be back at, um, I think we'll be back at around at uh, it's twelve fifteen here, so we will be back at one thirty um, on East Coast time, twelve thirty Central time. Yep, we'll be back at one thirty. Uh, I just want to remind people if you want to add questions, they're on the on the link below the dialogue that we're having. There's a space for you to submit questions, longer questions, detailed questions, and comments. A goal of this workshop really is to gather all of these diverse voices. So I really, really um, thank this panel and all of the different perspectives that were brought to this discussion. And we will have another engaging discussion starting at 1.30. So please join us.